My name is John Austin, and I'm an independent game developer. Uh, and so I'm here to talk about color. Uh, so let's set the scene a little bit just to get started. Uh, the year is 1931, and that means a couple of things are true. Uh, math is done on slide rules, so there's barely the concept of you know, electrical computing. You know, electricity is still coming to rural parts of America. Like, there's this big push to electrify the rural America. 30% like of homes are still without power. Um, and you know, on top of that, at this time, the stock market had just crashed. And this was you know, the biggest depression in US history, but also worldwide. 16% right? like of the entire world was without work, 25% uh, in the US. And so you know, in, the, in the midst of all of this, uh, a bunch of people decided to, that you know, this would be a good time to get together and, and come up with like, a unified standard of color. Um, and so <laughs> a bunch of people met in this dusty room in, in France. And, and sort of decided to, to come up with the systems that actually underlie in all the systems that we use today uh, for RGB and the color that we use, even into like kind of the digital era. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of a testament to sort of the, the, the prescience of, of the work they did there that it, it still lasts all the way to nearly 100 years later. You know, and in today's world, color is just everywhere, right? It's in, it's in our images, it's in like, the web, it's in our books, it's in our clothing, right? When, when you want to go make a new you know, piece of clothing, you need to know what color to dye it, right? Somebody has to tell you what color to make. Um, and you know, in this crazy world of color, we must have these you know, fantastically complex systems to manage you know, the, the powerful nature of it. But you know, most of us probably just you know, eyeball the sliders until it looks about right. But, you know, what actually is RGB, right? Like, what is 100 red? Like, most people don't really have a good concept of it. And so, you know, what I want to talk about today is, is kind of the history of color. You know, how is it made? And how are these systems made? And then also the science of it. Like, what are the things we're actually using today? And how can we, you know, work backwards and follow the lineage back to the systems that were created in the 1930s? Um, you know, color is this like crazy weird subject because it's inherently subjective, right? It's like, you know, what is art and what is beauty and like color perception, right? But it's also, you know, insanely objective. It's, you know, wavelengths, it's light, you can measure it. You know, and sort of in the midst of all of this, there's color systems that try to represent it. Um, and so I've been, <laughs> ever since I learned about this stuff, I've been excited to give a talk on it because it's just every time you peel back a layer, you get something more and you learn something new about how we perceive the world. Uh, so it's just super cool. Um, and so that's what this talk's gonna be about. Um, so to start with, uh, let's look at a little bit of biology. So you can think of light as a pipeline. So you know, light bounces around the world, it hits your eye, bounces around inside there, hits a few sensors, and then goes to your brain. And so we can look at each of these kind of components individually. So light is a spectrum. Uh, it, it, what we can see visibly is a fairly small part of the spectrum, right? So that's, that on the left there is the spectrum of the sun. And most of the light that's put out by the sun is not visible to us at all, right? Um, it's either in the ultraviolet or in the infrared zones. Um, and so this like little chunk of visible light is sort of just biological happenstance. Like there's nothing particularly objective about the visible spectrum. It's just the way we're set up to see. Um, and in fact, you know, heat, for instance, like everything that is hot gives off light in the form of radiation, right? And so that's why you can you know, hold up a camera and see you know, an infrared picture of, of a heat signature, because it's, it's light in some respect, right? Um, so if we were built a little bit differently, like say we were a bee or like you know, some other animal, uh, we would see just different parts of the spectrum. Um, you know, and so light isn't necessarily quite as, you know, light and color aren't as objective as it might seem at first. Um, and so, you know, we have this spectrum, right, and it you know, goes into our eye and it hits these things called cones. And the cones are our sensors in our eyes that are primarily responsible for our color perception. Uh, we, so we have three types of cones. Uh, we have our short cones, the medium cones, and the long cones. And each of these cones responds to a different part of the spectrum. And you, know, you can sort of already see something interesting here, which is that these cones kind of align to red, green, and blue to some degree. You know, it's not perfect. Um, but you can think about why we might use these colors as our basis for you know, color definition, because they, they nicely space along the spectrum, right? It gives us a lot of resolution in that way. 
And it's kind of weird, too. It's like, well, okay, our green cone is really heavily overlapping on the red cone, right? And we can think about how that might like add some weirdness to the way that we perceive colors around those zones, right? So we have these three cones, and, and basically each cone ends up kind of producing a number. So if you're looking at this, you know, so let's say you're looking at an apple, and you know, you're looking at maybe this, that little pixel, right? You know, like the two degree, you know, part of the, your vision that is seeing that color. Each of your cones is gonna respond in a different way. And so you kind of get these three numbers that are sent to the brain. Uh, and, and you can sort of measure these, you know, you can actually put units on them, but, but they're more like brain units. They're not, you know, especially in the 1930s, they weren't about to measure these. But you know, now we can with modern technology. Um, but the interesting part about this setup is that we can actually describe all color that we can see with just three numbers, which it shouldn't be inherently intuitive to you, right? Like light is this crazy spectrum of all these numbers and different types of waves, and, but you, know, you only need three numbers to describe every single visible color that you can see. Um, and this is why all of our color systems use three numbers, because that's all you really need at, at, at the base level. Um, so, you know, this you know, then also brings up an interesting question, which is like, well, what if you have two spectrums, and maybe they're wildly different, but they map to the same color, right? Because this is a lossy operation. There's way more spectrums than there are, you know, three-digit numbers. Um, and so this is what's called a metamer. Um, and so these are all around us all the time. So you might think that, you know, the green of the grass and the green of a lime and the green of tea is, you know, all the same color, but in reality, these are wildly different spectrums. It just happens to be that you perceive them as the same color. Um, and in fact, this is how modern display technology works, right? It's all about how do you tickle those cones just well enough to pretend that you're seeing the right color, right? They're not actually trying to recreate the spectrum on the monitor, they're just trying to make you think that you're seeing the colors. Um, so, we can think about, you know, other animals that, you know, might be set up differently. So like the humble pigeon, he is a pentachromat, so he has five cones. And you know, when the pigeon looks at colors in the world, you might see totally different colors, right? Again, it's this like sort of biological happenstance, right? So like color is pretty weird, right? It it seems objective at the start, but the way we describe color might end up needing to be a little bit more brain-like than we might think. Um, and being able to talk about colors is you know, it's important, right? Like, even in the 1930s, this was important. And like, you know, we need some way to say, even though it's all this kind of in your head, right? We need some way to be like, oh, hey, you know, this is the color I'm talking about. And, you know, back then, the main concern they had, you know, they didn't have monitors, right? But, you know, they had signal lights on planes and boats. And so like, you know, as the world became more globalized, you know, it became important to, you know, know what colors are on different ships, right? Like, if you tell your ally that, <laughs> You know, you have green on the left and red on the right. Like, you best be sure that you know what green and red you're talking about so that you can, you know, communicate properly. So, you know, it, this seems kind of trivial, but this actually drove a lot of the, the color science research that defines all the systems we use today. And so, enter the CIE 1931 International Commission on Lighting. Um, and so this was basically a big convention um, with a bunch of different countries. And sort of the plan was, okay, we're all gonna get together and we're gonna vote on a specification that defines a standard for color. Um, and then, you know, they had sent out this specification ahead of time because, you know, back in that time, communication was hard and, and tiring and so they needed some time to kind of look over stuff. Um, and, and sort of the two big heavyweights in this convention were Britain and the US, and, and they had been doing most of the color science for the past decade or, or so. Um, and, and one of the big players um, from England was a man, man named John Gill, and he worked at the National Physical Laboratory there. Uh, and, and John Gill was pretty excited because it was his system that was to be um, voted on at this conference. Um, he had come up with this system of additive primaries, which is just to say that you can, you know, you can add colors together and you get new colors. Um, and it's kind of abstract, you know, it didn't really represent a, a close system to, to the way that humans think about color, um, but it had all these mathematical properties that were really nice. Um, and yeah, so this is, this is the system they were going to be voting on. Uh, and so there was another man at the conference, um, and his name was Erwin Priest. So Erwin Priest was the representative from the United States. Uh, he was the president of the Optical Society for America. And you know, when Erwin Priest got off the boat, he was mad. He was livid. And 
It might have been for good reason. I mean, I mentioned that they sent out those you know, resolutions ahead of time, but they had really only sent them out about a month in advance, and like, that wasn't nearly enough time to actually study them or do the, the rigorous kind of scientific um, research to actually you know, judge them so they could vote on them. So he was a little miffed by that. Um, you know, but the other thing was that the US actually already had a system of color. So they already had a standardized system. Um, and they had adopted this system a few years earlier. Um, and, and the US systems was not based on this additive primary um, stuff. It was based on something a little more pragmatic because it was driven by industry. So you know, it was basically based on you know, these things, hue, saturation, and brightness um, with different names. And you know, we might recognize that from today, and, and we can think of like, well, why do we use that in our color pickers? Because it's, you know, it's inherently kind of just a very pragmatic way about you know, reasoning about color. So he was angry, he was ready to fight. Um, <laughs> so uh, what did he do? Well, he you know, arranged for himself to arrive a week early um, so that he and John Guild could you know, have a talk before the conference. Uh, and you know, over the course of an exhaustive week, uh, you know, they kind of went back and forth debating their different systems. Uh, and you know, one of the cool things about John Guild's system is you know, even though it wasn't very pragmatic, it had this property that it could be transformed to other systems. So because it had these mathematics, you know, he basically showed how it could represent priest systems. So he slowly transformed it to, to priest systems to show how it's a better standard, even if it's not as pragmatic. Um, and then so basically over the course of the week, they, they settled on you know, a final set of systems. Uh, and so they, they, they scrapped the original systems that they, they sent out, you know, much to the other country's chagrin. Uh, <laughs> And so they presented you know, a new set of resolutions called the CIE 1931 Resolutions on Color. Um, and so you know, these are the systems that we, we use in a lot of ways that define like, all of our color spaces that we use, um, or at least the, you know, the, the fundamental bits of it. So the question remains, you know, like, well, OK, what are these color resolutions, right? You know? <laughs> uh, and like, you know, what is RGB? And like, what is a color space? Like, what are all these things? So, <laughs> That's kind of what we'll spend the rest of the talk doing. So like we'll, we'll go a little bit through the, the science of it and kind of explain it. what are these systems and we'll work our way all the way back to where we are today in the present. It's not, it's not too much, don't worry. All right, so let's go back to John Guild's system. So at the end of the day, uh, it was basically his system that was accepted to, with some modifications. And you know, his system was based on this concept of additive primaries. So you know, back in the day, you couldn't measure color. <laughs> so if, if you wanted to actually measure the spectrum, you'd need a spectrophotometer, and that hadn't been invented yet. So they had to be a little more creative. And so he came up with this experiment uh, where you, you put a target color on the left, um, say this kind of green color, and you know, uh, well, anyway, yeah, so this, let's say you have this target green color, uh, and you place three colors on the right that you do know the wavelengths for. Maybe you can prove this through physics or through some other means. Um, and then you sort of add and subtract them until you make up the color on the left. Um, and so that kind of gives you three numbers, right? It gives you how much of each of those primaries did you need to make up that color. And so you know, he did this with a bunch of different colors. And if you plot those in a three-dimensional space, um, with each axis being kind of you know, the amount of that color, um, then you get this volume of color. And this, you know, inherently, this is a color space. It's a space with a bunch of colors in it. And that's basically the, the most general definition. Um, color volume is another word for it, right? Um, and the interesting thing about a color space uh, is that you can do math in this color space, which also should not be very intuitive at all, because you know, color is this crazy spectrum. But as it turns out, you can take the three numbers from this color space that John Guild was working on, and you could add them together. And the color you got as a result would be the same color you'd get as you would in real life if you had you know, overlaid those lights. And so this property, which is like kind of amazing, is like the, the fundamental basis of how we use color. It's the reason we can do math on color at all, which you know, isn't necessarily a given. Um, and so they were, they were realizing this at the time, and so you know, that, that's how they put together these, these early color spaces. Um, so he sort of set about making this, this first color space, right, and mapping out the visible colors. But you know, he came up with this problem, and it's easiest to describe this problem if we go back into 2D. Um, we do this a lot in color science because 
reasoning about volumes and showing them is really hard. You can't look inside them easily. You need to render them. It's a total pain. So a lot of, a lot of the time, we project it down into a 2D, 2D space. So if this is all of the visible colors that we can see, right? And you know, we're John Guild, and we've picked three primaries. Maybe we put them here, you know, right on the edges of visible color. Um, then all the colors we can make are inside of this triangle, because those are the colors that can be blended between those three primaries. And so the realization here is that you can't actually recreate all visible colors with a fixed set of primaries. And you know, that should make you think, well, that also means that today, right, if you have a monitor, you can't actually make a monitor that can represent all visible colors. It's impossible if you, if you just use a fixed set of primaries. Um, you know, in fact, if you have $6,500 to burn in your pocket, you can go buy a laser TV that has like no less than six laser primaries, and it gets you pretty, pretty dang close, but it's still, you still, you know, you're only inching your way to, to covering this volume. Uh, so you know, he realized this at the time, and so in order to map out the space, he needed to be a little more creative. Um, let's say you have this cyan color, and so some of these colors are gonna, you know, the color space of this display is limited, the projector is. Uh, so uh, you'll have to imagine some of this, but I think it should work for the most part. So let's imagine you have this cyan color that you can't make with these other two primaries. Um, what you can do instead is you can add a color on the other side um, and sort of treat it like a negative color. Um, and you know, it, if you do that, then you actually can make those colors equal. And so by using this sort of negative trick, he was able to map out the full color space. Um, and what he created was something called CIE RGB. And this is the first color space. Um, it's sort of the, the granddaddy of all historical color spaces. And it's different than the RGB you're thinking of. Um, this is CIE RGB. And it you know, just happens to also use red, green, and blue as the primaries. Um, and you can sort of see, you know, here's, there's the negative colors hanging off the back there. But, you know, what was really cool about this is now we have a way that we can talk about colors. You know, you can, the Navy can come to you and be like, you know, we need some color for our colored glass. And they'll be like, oh, well, that's a negative 2.7.6. And, you know, you know what you're talking about. It's, you can go look it up. And what you can do is you can, you know, take that number and transform it, you know, back to the spectrum. Um, you can sort of use a scientific process to kind of test your glass until you know that it's properly recreating the color you want. Um, and so this is, a, you know, this is a big invention, right? Like, now we can finally reason about color in a very objective way. Um, but, you know, this color space, it's got a lot of problems, right? It, it, negatives are super weird, right? Like, what is a negative red, anyway? And, like, you're doing math on slide rules. Like, neg negatives are awful. Um, and, you know, this is one of the big, you know, the big criticisms of priests, too. Uh, and, you know, what are the boundaries of this, right? Like, uh, it's sort of based on this experimental methodology. Eh, it's not that great. Um, and so th what they realized is they needed to make a more ergonomic uh, color space. And, you know, we talked about how color spaces can be transformed. Like, that's the big property of color spaces. And so what we can do is, well, let's transform this color space into something more mathematically ergonomic. Let's just stretch it and squish it into something better. So, and then, you know, here's, here's a big point about these transformations, is that they have to be linear. And basically all linear means is that the origin has to stay in the same spot and lines have to stay straight. Um, an easy way to check to see if your transformation is linear is if, can it fit in a three by three matrix? If you can, it's linear, you're all good. Uh, otherwise, you can't. Um, yeah, and so it's important that you need this linearity property in order to get that mathematical behavior we talked about, right? As long as your transformation is linear, then addition and subtraction in that new color space will still recreate the properties of real life. Um, and so this is like, this is the property we want. So, you know, they set about making this new ergonomic mathematical color space. Um, and, you know, again, they were kind of clever. They realized that, well, okay, you know, previously our visible, uh, our primaries were in the visible color space. but. You know, if we choose our primaries to be imaginary, then we can stretch our color space to be entirely positive. And, you know, this is super weird. It's like only mathematical, right? Like, you can't represent these colors at all in real life. Um, and, and so they called it XYZ because, well, these primary, these axes don't have any meaning anymore. So they were like, oh, I'll just call them XYZ. Um, 
And XYZ is great. Like it's, it's mathematically beautiful. Everything's positive. It's all less than one. They put white at one third. Um, you know, one thing they did as well, and here's like a 3D sort of representation. They aligned the Y axis with brightness. So if you want to know how bright a color is, you just have to look at the second value. Um, super easy. Uh, and so, you know, CIE XYZ, this is, you know, you know, nobody really talks about, you know, all these other color spaces um, b before CIE XYZ. Like, XYZ is kind of like the main, the main player in today's world. Uh, if you want to make a new color space, let's say you're Adobe, you would provide a transformation back to CIE XYZ. You'd, you know, you can go on Wikipedia and you can find the three by three matrices that get you back to CIE XYZ for all your favorite color spaces. Um, and in doing so, that sort of proves that it's you know, a valid color space, that it represents all visible colors and that you can transform between them, right? So, flashing forward to 2019, you know, now we're in the digital world, right? So that, that's sort of the end of right, the 30s um, you know, with CIE XYZ. But now, you know, colors everywhere. Like, we have all these other concerns about monitors and displays and images and computing. And, and so in the 70s, they realized that they needed, you know, a color space that was really built for the digital world. Um, and this color space is called sRGB. And this is the color space that you've been waiting for. This is, like, the standard RGB. And so when you use that color picker in Chrome or, you know, Photoshop, it's in, in sRGB. That's the color space of the values you're specifying. Um, and it's easiest to show sRGB. Um, it's a color space like all the others, um, but we usually we show them against XYZ. Because XYZ is this sort of like forefather of, of color spaces. We can, we can kind of compare them. So if we show the 2D you know, visible gamut of CIE XYZ, we can say that, okay, sRGB is a subset of it. And we know it has to be a subset because you know, our monitors use visible primaries, right? You know, you have to, the corners of a triangle have to be visible colors, so you know, it has to be a subset. But it's a particularly small subset too, which you, know, you might wonder why that is. I mean, it was originally designed for CRT monitors, uh, and CRT displays couldn't show anything more than that, so why would you waste the bits? Um, so uh, we can also show that in this in, in 3D as well against kind of CIE XYZ. And you can see that it's not, you know, it's not a triangle, right? It's, it's really this three-dimensional prism shape. Um, but it's a lot thinner, right? It's missing a lot of these, these uh, more interesting colors. You know, an interesting thing to note about this, right, is you're looking at this right now in sRGB, right? This display uses sRGB. So this entire presentation has been compressed, right, down into, it's been projected. And there's all sorts of transformations you can use to project it. But uh, it, what you're seeing right now is yeah, it's like a relative like, you know, judgment of, of these color spaces. So um, those greens you know, that seem to be missing, you, know, you can't see them anyway. So <laughs> Anyway, uh, so sRGB, like the others, is just one more transformation. So it's, you get this kind of mathematical lineage coming. Uh, so you know, sRGB, it's kind of this universal transfer format, right? Everything uses it. Um, but it's got this weird quirk, and it's easiest to explain it if we talk about kind of human perception. So when you look at, uh, let's, say, let's say, like a linearly increasing uh, brightness of, of color, uh, we're much better at telling the difference between darker colors than brighter colors. The, the, white, the big bright whites kind of wash out to us, whereas we can find a lot of subtleties in, in the darker colors, relatively speaking. And so they realized this in the 70s, and they decided, well, in that case, why don't we not spread our bits uniformly? We'll you know, put more bits down at the, the part we can tell the difference between, which makes a lot of sense, right? If you're really bit limited, you know, it's, it's important that you spend those really uh, on the parts that, make, uh, that are most important. And so what they did is they, well, OK, with this 3x3 three three matrix, they also applied this extra operation, um, which is called the gamma curve. And it's, it's essentially a square root. It's, you know, it's, it's a piecewise. It's not exactly a square root, but generally you can call it a square root. Um, you, you can look it up on Wikipedia. But uh, essentially what this curve does is you know, spread out the color space such that it's kind of a little more optimal for storage. Um, you know, but the weird thing about this extra transformation is that it's not linear. And we made this big fuss about 
you know, how we want our transformations to be linear so that we have, so the math works in the new color spaces. And, and so that what actually ends up happening is that you know, math in sRGB is not correct. And so what that means is that if you add two colors in sRGB, like the color space you use every day, um, you won't get the color you would get if you added them in real life. Um, and so this is sort of like the perpetual problem of like in incredible amounts of software. Um, if you take away like one thing from this talk, it's that you probably shouldn't be doing math in sRGB. Um, like convert it to some other color space, any other color space, basically. Um, but you know, sRGB is still important because it's a universal transfer format, and you know, it's got great bit density and stuff like that. Um, but you know, like you might think that maybe this isn't a big deal that much. Um, but so like, let's look at an example. So back in 2010, most game rendering at that time was being done in sRGB directly because you know that was the color space they were using. They didn't really have the performance to think about it too much. Um, and what you get is you get all of your light being thrown through this exponential function, and so like you, your whites get crunched and your darks get crunched, and it looks really awful. Um, and so you know after 2010, they started doing physical, uh, physically based rendering. And everything looked much better because what they did was they used a linear color space. Um, and you know, generally what most game engines use nowadays is something called linear sRGB, which is essentially to say it's sRGB, but they don't do that you know, extra gamma curve. They don't do the square root, they just drop that. So then they keep the whole transformation linear and that makes it a linear color space, so everything's good. And then you get these much better colors. Okay, so we've we've got our we've got our like, two main color spaces now. We've got like sRGB. That's what you use. But you know, if you want to do math on it, you should probably be using something linear. But it's not quite the end of the picture. Um, you know, there's lots of times where maybe we don't want scientific accuracy, right? Like this has all been about recreating the properties of real light. We've been trying to you know, find color spaces that let you, you know, yeah, recreate these behaviors of like overlaying lights in the real world, but you know, sometimes you want to do something like more artistic. You care more about perception. So, like, look, let's look at an example. Um, so, this is a constant brightness slice of, you know, the sRGB spectrum, and what that means is that the intensity of the wavelengths of light that are leaving the screen, going to your eye, are all equal, or at least the projector is doing its darndest to to try to make it equal. Um, and what you can notice about this is that these colors don't look perceptually equal in their brightness. Um, we have this tendency to perceive yellows especially as particularly bright compared to you know, corresponding blues, and same with whites. Um, and so our, our color perception is not perceptually smooth. <clears throat> you know, and so let, let, let's look at another color space. So there's this color space called CIE Lab. And CIE Lab is a color space that's built to spread it out such that uh, the color space is fully perceptually uniform. Um, and so what you get is this incredible, like, smooth gradient of you know, what looks actually perceptually um, uniform. Uh, and the, we you know, the weird thing about CIE Lab is that you know, CIE Lab intentionally does these nonlinear operations. Right? It's no longer accurate to real life, but it does them intentionally such that when you do math in CIE Lab, it makes something that looks more perceptually correct, um, which I think is really cool. Like, CIE Lab totally blows my mind. Like, there are a few things that you can do where you can just drop something into your project and all of a sudden it looks 10 times better. Um, CIE Lab is basically the secret gem of the data visualization community, like D3JS, all these people. Because all of these you know, visualizations are driven by data and math, right? Um, and so they want these crazy nice linear gradients, right? But if you do a gradient in RGB, you get this kind of dark spot in the middle. Um, it's a little easier to see if you squint sometimes. Um, and the projector is a little rough. But basically, if you try to interpolate through RGB, the color space wasn't built for interpolating. It was built for math, like adding and subtracting. And so you, sometimes you can get these weird hues that just pop out of nowhere. But lab was built for you know, uniformness. And so it's, it's, when you interpolate through lab, you get these great gradients. Um, yeah, so this is like really what power is data is. Um, and like, you know, let's look at one more example of lab just because I think it's so cool. So 
you know, you might think this is a pretty trivial operation. Like we want to, let's say we want to desaturate a, an image, right? Just, just make it grayscale. And so we, we take this painting of a sunflower, right? And you know, it might look pretty similar. Um, but look at that sunflower, right? So we've, we've grayscaled it in, in RGB at the top, in linear RGB, so this would be correct to real light, right? Um, but that sunflower is super dark compared to lab, and we can sort of zoom in just to emphasize that point. Like, like look how much worse it looks. Um, and one thing you can kind of note is like, on the edges of those petals there, there's these like little white spots. Um, and those white spots aren't really present on the original image. It just so happens that these like two hues you work out such that you know the actual intensity of light is like really different, um, but to our brains we see them as very perceptually similar. Um, and so when you're doing grayscale, like it might seem like a super simple operation, but it's actually a, a perceptual operation, right? We want to know what looks like the brightness of each pixel, and so we should do that generally in lab. And so I, I would suggest that if you know you're doing some math on color, that you you know think a little bit about which color space you might want to use. Um, I prepared a little bit of a table just to kind of help with that. And these slides will be up online later probably too. But you know, if, if you care about science and rendering and you, you really want to create you know, correct to life light, right? Um, then you want to use linear color. Um, you can use linear sRGB. There's lots of other linear color spaces. Um, but if you care about perceptual correctness, right? And you want something that's smooth and uniform, um, CIE Lab is definitely something interesting to reach for. I, I definitely recommend trying it out. Um, and of course, we have to use sRGB because everything expects sRGB. Our monitors expect it. The web expects it. Um, so at the end of the day, we still have to use it. But we should probably get it out of sRGB as soon as possible. I mean, like for instance, like all, you know, new MacBooks, right? They have better monitors. Like part of the reason they they look nicer is because they render a bigger subset of the visible spectrum. Um, but of course, that means if you're sending sRGB to your MacBook, you're not taking advantage of that nice. You know, spectrum that it can render. So, you know, you should think about you know, even if you are you know just rendering something to a display device, like what display device is that? And maybe you should use a different color space so that you can take advantage of those properties. So that's about it. Um, thanks for the, for listening. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I post about all sorts of crazy games and art and math and whatnot. Um, quick thanks to the the CIE, which is apparently still around and kicking, and helped me like come up with some primary sources and track down some articles from the original conferences. Um, but yeah, I have absolutely no clue if I have extra time. Um, five minutes? I can take some questions, yeah, if you have them. And then uh, otherwise, I'll just be outside. Yeah? Is CIE Lab still a subset of the color space? Right, so CIE Lab is, so you can see up there on the top right, that is the, that's the visible uh, the visible gamut of all colors in CIE Lab. So it, it does represent all visible colors. So one of the downsides of the CIE Lab is that um, it's not a subset, but that means you need floating point numbers. Um, so, you, uh, so CIE Lab is not an additive primary system. It's based on three numbers. It's based on lightness and then A and B. <laughs> uh, and where A and B are basically like the color, um, but because it's not based on additive primaries, they don't have that restriction where it has to be like you know a, just a subset of the visible spectrum. And so, so the, it, it's more a lot more like XYZ in that sense. Um, it's also it's also a little weird because lab by default it's not in the range zero to one; it's zero to hundred for some reasonable reason. Um, but but yeah, it can represent all visible colors. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. So, so it's, the question is, you know, when you're looking at these 3D volumes, like, what does that really mean? What, like, what is the reasoning behind that? Um, so, yeah, you're looking at this, essentially the surface. And, and the reason we do so much in 2D is because, with these 2D slices, is because, yeah, you can't see into this volume, right? Um, yeah, like, really, it's, it's basically like a... You, you could take a slice throughout the entire thing, like a cross section, and you'd see you know, different colors changing. And, um, so like, it, it's, it's a volume, not a surface. Um, so there's colors inside of it. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, 
That's a good question. Yeah, man. Uh, I would, I, I would have loved to talk about print because there's so much there. Like, there's all sorts of crazy different color spaces. Um, I had to leave a lot off for time concerns. Um, so print is based on something called CMYK. And so that's four numbers, which is odd. Um, but print is unique because it's, it's a lot more driven by the, the sort of material science and like the actual process of making and printing things out than it is by trying to represent colors mathematically. Um, so CMYK is you know, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> technically, it stands for key, which is like an old term, but yeah, anyway. Uh, so CMYK is also weird because it's device dependent. So like all these color spaces we've been talking about, a single color represents a single color. Like that's, it's just, that's what it is. That's the color. Um, but CMYK, it depends on what printer you're talking about, what kind of ink you're talking about. So like you might have, you know, CMYK this number, but it only represents a certain color if you know what ink you're talking about. And, know, and if you change the paper, everything changes, because the reflectance changes. CMYK is also subtractive, um, which is a little weird in the sense that um, it's, C it's CMYK because cyan represents the removal of red, right? So if you add cyan, that's like removing red. And so it, it, there's a lot of messiness in there. It's also you know, dotted, like it's actually what these what's called half-toning, which is kind of like uh, what comic books use, where they kind of um, dot everything to sort of blend the colors in your head. It's, I, I would uh, definitely will I take more questions afterwards if we could talk a lot about print. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Sure. Given that um, monitors are displaying RGB, why do two monitors display different colors? Uh, in different, but it's the same color in a different way. It's because they're bad monitors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is why people who, you know, work doing art for a living, care a lot about getting a really nice monitor because rapid, OK, so <laughs> it's the last question, I guess. Uh, so yeah, like, um, yeah, not all monitors are made equal. So like we talked about, like, you have this RGB color space, and you, know, you want to go back and map that back to the spectrum, right? But that's a really hard transformation. It's like, OK, how do I get these LED lights to like, get the right colors and, and tickle your cones in the right ways? Um, and so, you know, cheaper monitors just do a worse job at it. And you, you can actually buy something called a spider, which will um, sit on top of the monitor, analyze it, and then recalibrate your monitor um, to the best it can, which I, I don't know if I'd recommend for everyone, but if you really care about color, that might be something to do. Um, okay, well, I mean, I'll definitely take more questions outside. Um, uh, but thanks for coming. I uh, hope you learned something.